In this video, we'll cover psychologist Carl Jung's legendary Red Book, which chronicles the search for his lost soul through vivid confrontations with his unconscious mind. Almost a century after its conception, and after years of negotiations with Jung's estate for its publication, Red Book editor Sanyu Shamdasani summarizes the work. The overall theme of the book is how Jung regains his soul and overcomes the contemporary malaise of spiritual alienation. This is ultimately achieved through enabling the rebirth of a new image of God in his soul and developing a new worldview in the form of a psychological and theological cosmology. I know that's a lot to unpack, and we won't get to every last detail. My intention is to provide you with a primer for the work as a whole, to impart on you its importance, its main themes, and plant a seed of interest for you to get this book, The Holy Grail of the Unconscious, in your own hands. For those unacquainted, Carl Jung was a massively influential Swiss psychiatrist in the first half of the 20th century. He was the founder of analytical psychology and claimed his many scientific breakthroughs arose entirely from the events revealed in the Red Book. Close colleague Sigmund Freud considered Jung, quote, his adopted eldest son, his crown prince and successor. Their relationship, however, came to an end in 1912 when Jung published Psychology of the Unconscious which sharply broke with Freud's theories. Everyone he knew professionally abandoned him as well, save for two of his colleagues. In the wake of this resounding censure, from 1913 to 1914, he had 12 distinct visions that one may consider precognitive. These apocalyptic visions occurred in the months leading to World War I. One could easily say Jung, then 38, was on the brink of a midlife crisis. Amidst severe professional turmoil, an extramarital affair, and a world on the verge of war, Jung embarked on what he would later call his, quote, most difficult experiment. The Red Book is his written and illustrated account of these experiences. In 1913, Jung began his confrontation with the unconscious through a process he called active imagination, a meditation technique where the contents of one's unconscious are translated into narratives, images, or personified as distinct entities. Functionally, he's constructing a bridge between the conscious ego and the unconscious. Many nights in the solitude of his study, Jung entered the state by inducing a waking dream or reverie and in turn switching off consciousness. While I don't believe Jung ever labeled it as such, it seems as though he entered into a hypnagogic state, the transitional zone or edge of chaos between wakefulness and sleep. Incidentally, many other artists, writers, scientists, and inventors, including Beethoven, Dali, Edison, Tesla, and Newton, have credited hypnagogia and similar transitional mental states with enhancing their creativity. The best known example is August Kekulé's discovery that the structure of benzene is a closed ring while in a hypnagogic state seated in front of a fire. The chemist had a vision of molecules forming into snakes, one of which eats its own tail by its mouth. More on serpents and the Ouroboros symbol in a future video. Back to Jung. So, he engages in this twilight practice of inner reflection, digging and plunging into the depths of the subconscious for years. Let's dive into the design of these fantasies. The original Red Book is massive, bound in a red leather folio and weighing nearly 10 pounds. It contains over 400 pages of handwritten, medieval, calligraphic text and 53 magnificent full-page paintings. Stylistically, the Red Book is heavily indebted to Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra and Dante's Divine Comedy. Much like in Dante's Inferno, Jung must descend into the underworld to redeem his lost soul. Other influences include the Book of Revelations, Eastern Scripture, and William Blake poetry among many others. 
Jung shared the contents of the Red Book with a select few trusted colleagues, reasonably concerned that it could damage his reputation as a scientist and pigeonhole him as a mystic. For nearly half a century after Jung's death, his family estate kept it hidden from scholars. The full story of its history and eventual publication is well detailed in a New York Times piece linked below. Much like the best basketball player to never make an all-star team, teaser for a future video, the Red Book has been billed as the most influential unpublished work in the history of psychology. The Red Book is broken into three parts. And throughout, Jung converses with his soul, serpents, Gilgamesh, God, Christ, the devil, and most prominently, biblical figures Salome and Elijah. Like Dante's Virgil, the prophet Elijah is Jung's guide through the underworld. Elijah later becomes Philemon, Jung's guru who flies using massive kingfisher wings. For most of Liber Primus, Jung wanders the landscape of his unconscious in self-reflection. Finally, in chapter 9 of 11, he meets Elijah and Salome for the first of several encounters. Part 2, Liber Secundus, takes on a more farcical tone. Perhaps by this point in his hero's journey, Jung has grown accustomed to his special world, better framing boundaries and calling out absurdities. Liber Tertius incorporates active imaginations not included in Jung's original manuscripts and is dominated by Philemon's Gnostic Seven Sermons to the Dead, a much-needed conclusion and astute inclusion by editor Sanu Shamdasani. At its most basic level, editor Shamdasani has stated the book's message as, quote, value your inner life. While the accounts are deeply personal, Jung wished to unearth an underlying universal human experience. These are not solely dialogues with himself, but with the burden of human history. A revelation of the collective unconscious, if you will. A major struggle for Jung was his overdeveloped intellect, which he relied on to the deprivation of the other half of his soul. Naturally, geniuses tend to overvalue their intelligence. This dichotomy is split between the Logos, as represented by Elijah, and Eros, as symbolized by Salome. Logos being the Greek term for rationality, Eros being the desire for wholeness and connection with other sentient beings. You can think of Logos as order and Eros as disorder. In Jung's mythopoetic trance, Salome, doubling as both Eros and his soul, is blind because she is underdeveloped inside him. Relatedly, in Liber Secundus, Jung rendezvous with Isdubar, the ancient name for the Sumerian epic hero Gilgamesh. As author Matthew Spano puts it, the tone is tragic here as Jung becomes aware too late of the tyranny of reason and intellect in their tendency to strike down and poison other modes of thinking, such as the visionary, the magical, and the imaginative. While he makes some headway with the integration of Eros by the end of the Red Book, symbolized by her regaining her sight, Jung never seems to fully embrace his soul. Similarly, the anima or feminine part of his psyche is awakened yet never fully assimilated. At the end of the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche famously wrote, God is dead, expressing the idea that the age of enlightenment, science and reason, had killed him. Jung disagrees with a Gnostic framing that God can be resurrected as a psychological experience or archetype. By now disillusioned with scientific rationalism, Jung held that myth is more individual and expresses life more precisely than does science. Fundamentally, you are the center of your own myth. In his visions, he comes upon a deceased child and is commanded by his soul to eat her liver. He interprets the child as the image of God, and he symbolically slays God, which he likens to the act of communion. 
So long as we leave the God outside us apparent and tangible, he is unbearable and hopeless. But if we turn the God into fantasy, he is in us and is easy to bear. As signified by the revival of Isdubar, Jung realizes that as the giant's powers strengthen, his own weaken, and vice versa. As written in John 3.30, he, meaning God, must increase, I must decrease. Jung realizes he must find balance with God, and not kill him with his ego inflation and intellect. The ultimate lesson is that divinity is only attainable through proper integration, by walking the middle path. There is way more packed into the Red Book than we can conceivably cover in one video, but I want to quickly touch on some of my favorite details. First, in several entries, Jung highlights the deceptive nature of reality slash God. Just one excerpt. The experience of the God in this form was unexpected and unwanted. I wish I could say it was a deception, and only too willingly would I disown the experience, but I cannot deny that it has seized me beyond all measure and steadily goes on working in me. So if it is a deception, then deception is my God. Moreover, the God is in the deception. I recognize the God by the unshakableness of the experience. A hundred years later, there is a wealth of research around deception inherent in the natural world. Explained in Cheats and Deceits, How Animals and Plants Exploit and Mislead by Martin Stevens, and in Deceit and Self-Deception, Fooling Yourself the Better to Fool Others by Robert Trivers. The mystery seems built in. If you're interested in this topic, I covered a related theory by cognitive scientist Donald Hoffman that explores the illusory nature of reality, linked above and below. In short, he posits that due to biological evolution, humans do not perceive reality as it actually is, but rather reconstruct a world that maximizes biological fitness. I nearly jumped out of my seat when I read the following excerpt from the Red Book. Fullness and emptiness, generation and destruction, are what distinguish God and the devil. Effectiveness is common to both. Effectiveness joins them. Effectiveness, therefore, stands above both and is a God above God, since it unites fullness and emptiness through its effectuality. Finally, the psychedelic question. Jung claimed he never took hallucinogens. Though, given the parallels between Jung's visions and the accounts of those on heroic doses of mind-altering entheogens, there is some speculation he experimented with these substances. He even once compared the Red Book period to a mescaline experiment. Now, he was openly interested in esoteric practices such as witchcraft, alchemy, and yoga, the last being exotic for the time. Given his candor regarding those activities, and that he was in his 70s during the golden age of psychedelic research, I think it's unlikely he ever used them. In fact, Jung was generally against the use of hallucinogens, once warning users to, quote, beware of unearned knowledge. Even so, psychonauts in particular will be intrigued by Jung's encounters with the Kabiri, gnome-like deities from ancient Greek mythology. They bear resemblance to shamanic accounts from Native Americans, African tribes, and indigenous Australians. Nasty tricksters possessing creative powers, they sound comparable to the machine elves popularized by Terence McKenna. Make of that what you will. We've only scratched the surface of this landmark work, which I highly recommend you read for yourself. It's pricey at about 130 bucks online, or check your local library like I did. Though as one psychologist warns, you have to be careful reading Jung because he'll quote, reorganize your cognitive structures. That sounds like a stretch, but I can personally say he's done that for me. In my past few weeks with this book, I've experienced dozens of anomalies in my waking life. So many, it's hard to chalk them up to coincidence and Jung didn't believe in coincidences. If you've made it this far and are interested in the theme of finding purpose in the modern world, you should check out my video on Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, 
linked here and below. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and don't forget to integrate your shadow.